further ado, I would like to bring Rolf Mollick, who is our first keynote speaker, to the floor. While Rolf is actually setting himself up, I'd just like to, to do a bit of an introduction. Rolf actually owns um, and manages the dialogue design over in Denmark. And Rolf, is, uh, Rolf, as you can imagine, is what I would consider a bit of a UCD guru. He's been around and he knows what he's talking about. And I think that you will find his presentation very entertaining. Rolf, I will leave it up to you. Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you very much for inviting me to, to this event. <clears throat> I'm not going to say very much about myself, except that, as you can hear from my funny accent, I'm not from the United Kingdom. I live and work in Denmark. But I think, instead of telling you a lot about myself, I actually have some dogmas that I work from. And before coming to the heart of this uh, discussion, or the heart of this presentation, I'd really like to share two dogmas with you. A dogma is, as, as you may believe, a basic belief that is not to be questioned. And let me put it a little bit differently. If you don't agree with these dogmas, you may be very upset about the rest of my talk. <laughs> so my dogma number one is that we must do as we preach. We are usability professionals. We have a special responsibility for being very usable in all our doings and all our work. And I'm sure that many of you will say, well, that's absolutely natural, of course. How dare he uh, uh, even hint at that we should not be perfect with respect to usability ourselves. Well, let me give you just an example to show you what, what kind of things I'm after. In a study that I did recently, oh, no, sorry, the slide wants it differently. Sometimes we're even pointing fingers at other people. When we write a usability test report, it usually contains some fair and balanced criticism of what other people are doing. When we do an expert review, it's similar. But remember, when you point your finger at someone, there are actually three that point back at you, yourself. Keep that in mind next time you criticize someone. Sweep before your own door, before you sweep the doorsteps of your neighbors. That's essentially what my dogma comes down to. This is really what I was after a moment ago, a usability result presented in a usability test report. Now, without knowing too much about the actual usability test that this was about, it was about an American car rental site, I'm sure that you will agree with me that this result is rather overwhelming, to put it diplomatically. Of course it was since it was made by professional usability people, it was followed by a full page with legends. And they were not really very intuitive. I have the fortune of being the first speaker in this uh, event, but let me try to make a prediction. I hope I'm totally wrong in what I'm saying now. I predict that a number of the presentations that you're going to see today and tomorrow will end with a slide that looks something like this. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? And then, of course, the most important information of all, the contact information of the speaker. Now, I did that myself until about three years ago when I read a letter to the editor in the communications of the ACM saying, a real usability professional, of course, ends with a slide that shows the key points, the takeaways from his or her talk. And the takeaways are not my email address, surprise. They're not any questions. They're the highlights. They're the one things, they are the things that I want you to take away from the presentation. <clears throat> my second dogma is about how do I know that? And my talk here is based on data, real data that I've accumulated over the years. Some of you may know that the Americans, I don't know about the British, you might have something similar. The Americans have something that's called a bake-off. Sometimes Americans meet and each of them bring one or two cakes. 
And then a prize committee, through some very complicated algorithm, decides which of them it has made the best case. And in this case, I think that this one has actually got a prize. It doesn't look very uh, tempt uh, sumptuous to me, but it, it won anyway. Now, the idea came to me about 14 years ago. How about if we make a usability bake-off instead? The idea being that all of us, all participants, say about 15, test the same website independently and simultaneously. And afterwards, we meet and compare the results and wonder at the differences, I should add. Because what we saw again and again was people did not come up with the same results. Here's actually our, our last usability bake-off, codenamed code CUE9, Comparative Usability Evaluation number 9. All of these people here, there should be 19 in total, all of these 19 <coughs> people here had watched the same five videos of a usability test of a US website, the US website for U-Haul, uh, which is a company in the States that rents um, moving vans. And the results were rather interesting. These people who saw exactly the same thing, they saw exactly the same videos, they found 100, more than 100 different usability issues. Of course, a few of them were reported by almost all teams. There was none of the findings were reported by all teams. But a few of them came close, like about 90% or 85% of the teams reported the same thing. But many of the findings were unique. They were just reported by, they were reported by single teams only. This is the largest study that I've ever done of this kind because we repeated it a few months later in Chemnitz in Germany in connection with the annual, with their annual UPA conference. And we found exactly the same pattern. And the Germans found, I think, about 30 usability problems that had not been reported by any of the Americans. And there were some of the problems reported by the Americans that were not reported by any of the Germans. So the important lesson to take away from this is whatever you're doing when you're usability testing, if someone else did the same test, they would not find the same results. So to summarize, the CUE, the Comparative Usability Evaluation Studies, provide data. That's what I want to share with you in the rest of my talk. They provide data to fight unsubstantiated myths and voodoo. Unfortunately, I believe that there's a lot of that in our field. And I'll show you towards the end a few of the things that we could do as usability professionals to improve our standard so our results will become just a little bit more uniform. I believe a lot in audience participation and among the things that were on your seat when you came, there were three colored sheets which we're going to use later on for voting. And there was also one sheet that contained a number of statements. And it, it actually looks very much like the one that's up on the, uh, on the projector now. now. I'm going to stop talking for a few, mo for a few moments and let you just look at this. There are five simple statements and please indicate whether you agree or disagree or if you're a little wishy-washy, both agree and disagree with the statements. And there's also room on the right hand side to make a few notes uh, justifying your uh, choice.
right? Let's start with the first one. And I think it's, very it's a very important <coughs> part of this talk that I get your feedback on each of these statements and that you see, that you also see the feedback from your participants. So I color-coded each of these, green one, there's a statement up here. Five uses are enough to catch 85% of the usability problems in practically any product. You might have heard this as a famous usability guru who has said something like this. And you can vote on this statement. One of the sheets is green. Raise that if you agree. Yellow sheet, both agree and disagree. And the red sheet, if you disagree with that statement. So let me see a show of sheets at this time. And please look around, because that may be the most interesting part of it, to see that we do not really agree on a key issue like this one. Thank you very much. You may take down the sheets again. And so I was asked uh, when I did this pre presentation previously, Rolf, what is your view on this statement? Now you've shown that there's a diversity in the community, but what's my view on it? Well, I happen to disagree with that statement. And I know that the guru has said, and he has even shown a nice curve that shows very nicely, very nice and smooth curve that shows very precisely that with six uses, you will find 86.335% of all the usability problems in practically any problem. And he has even given a nice formula. And the guru, of course, is Jacob Nielsen in his famous alert box from, 2000, uh, from March 2000. I must say to Jacob's defense that he doesn't really think so anymore. I'll come back in a moment to what he says. Jerry Spool sarcastically called this the parabola of optimism. And I think that's a very precise expression. What we have found in the CUE studies was that 60% of the problems were uniquely reported. And in one of our early studies, CUE4, which was about uh, uh, six years ago at this time, we reported more than 300 issues. They, they found more than 300 valid issues. Now, a simple arithmetic shows that 85% of 300 problems, that's more than 250 problems, now, any usability report that contained 250 problems would be basically unusable. You have to report you an important part of the, uh, of the job of a usability professional is to filter the usability problems that they find so they only report the most important ones in the order of magnitude of about 25. So, this is in my opinion, a correct statement, this is what I believe, that five users are enough to drive a useful iterative cycle. But please, please, never tell anyone that you find that you found all or almost all of the usability problems. That's impossible. All right. The main goal of a usability test is to discover usability problems. Let me see a show of sheets for, for that. Okay, again we see a nice variation in the colors of the sheets that are being held up. Thank you very much. Um, this statement, I actually both agree and disagree. Yes, of course it's an important part of a usability test to find usability problems. But there's another, even more important part of a usability test. And that's shown by this quote, real cowboy programmers don't need no stinking usability test. <laughs> I think that's a nice quote that shows one of the other reasons why it's so important to run usability tests. To convince your stakeholders, your co-workers, that their baby is not as pretty as they thought. Usability problems is not just something that occurs for your competitors. And a usability test is the strongest tool that I know of to show to people your baby is not as pretty as you might have thought, even though it's still charming. So the goals of a usability test are twofold. 
find problems so they can be corrected, demonstrate convincingly to skeptical stakeholders that problems exist and that there are efficient ways to correct them. Let's move on to number three. Expert reviews provide results that are as reliable as those from usability tests. Ah, interesting. We see some more consensus on this one. Lots of red ones and about an equal number of yellow ones and very, very few green ones. Which I am very happy to see because actually our results show this is a true statement. I know that there's literature from about 20 years ago which was made on very simple systems that says the opposite. <coughs> But our tests, our CUE studies, our real data just did not confirm that hypothesis. Expert reviews are efficient and they're actually a little bit cheaper than usability tests. Can I quickly ask, is that an expert usability system? How we use it, or is that a usability expert? That, uh, that's a very good question. Let me answer that. That's on the next slide. Okay. Uh, these findings <coughs> apply only when expert reviews are carried out by experts, which I think was, was your question. They do not apply when the expert reviews are carried out by users, which was Jacob's and my idea <coughs> 22 years ago when we came up with the heuristic inspection method. That has turned out not to work. But real expert reviews conducted by experienced experts do work. Expert reviews find as many problems as usability testing. Yeah, and yes, expert reviews overlook problems, but so do usability tests. Of course, I'm not saying that expert reviews are perfect. I am saying that they are as imperfect as usability tests. Expert reviews are slightly cheaper than usability tests. But beware, of course, expert reviews are political dynamite in an organization that's not mature. If your organization is not mature with respect to usability, be very, very careful with applying expert reviews unless you have a very good answer to the question, why are your opinions better than mine? I don't have a good answer to that question. If that question comes up, I immediately resort to usability tests because people, don't, people usually don't question a well-prepared usability test. All right, <coughs> next one. At least 25% of the comments in a usability test report should be positive. Uh, uh, we could, oh, that's what they are, okay. Lots of red ones, lots of yellow ones, and a few green ones. Well, this one, in my opinion, should have a double green. Yes, by all means, have positive findings in your usability test report. Even if it's all no. bad? Excuse me? Even if it's all bad? I have never seen a website that, or a product that was all bad. I can show you. I haven't. <laughs> The problem is, in my opinion, that people take the good things for granted. Let me just uh, elaborate a little bit on this one. The positive findings, first of all, why should we have them? They make it easier for you to sell inconvenient truths. You get a little more believable. You could not be a total idiot if you have positive findings, because at least the positive findings are okay. And you, they also help to ensure that the development team doesn't remove a feature that users actually like. Mary Poppins actually said this very nicely, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. That's essentially what I'm saying. You could phrase it slightly differently, even developers have feelings. <laughs> and I'm sure that you will agree with me that just like me, all of you also like a positive <coughs> pat on the shoulder every now and then. And I must say, of course, like this gentleman uh, in the center row, I have had some uh, systems, products that I tested, 
where it, I had to think a little bit before I could come up with the positive things. And of course, never be sarcastic. So for instance, oh, you chose a nice font for, uh, uh, for the text in your, uh, uh, on your web pages. And actually, just as a reminder, many of you are members of the UPA or the UXPA, and their code of conduct, they actually have a code of professional conduct, and they say that the CPC requires you to accurately report both the positive and negative feedback. If you can prove that there's nothing positive to say, then you have, of course, also fulfilled the CPC. But I don't know of any way to prove that. The point is that you must always remember the law of the instrument. When you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. So there's a spelling error, stomp it out. There's a color on, on the front page that some of the users didn't like, ah, stomp it out. Use that hammer very carefully. I see a trend in the usability test reports that I evaluate that people are very quick to classify problems as catastrophic. And yes, they are usability problems, but often users manage to find some clever way around them. Really serious usability problems are ones that cause you to lose your fortune or kill you. I very rarely, I, they do exist. But they are rare. But we devaluate our rating scale by using words like critical or serious, must be corrected at any price, without proper reason. Here's how the CUE9 teams did. We had 16 that shows results for 16 uh, teams. Only two of them reported 8 and 10 problems respectively thus exceeding the 25% limit. So if you're not reporting, or if you're reporting only very few positive issues, you're in good company, because these were some very good people. <coughs> and there were, but there were just two of them who reported no positive findings at all. All right, usability, the next statement. Usability testing can be conducted by anyone. Chandra is holding the red one very high. <laughs> All right, lots of yellow and red ones and a few green ones. Well, this one, with this one, I'd like to come up with a standard usability answer, which says it depends. <laughs> Essentially, I think that this statement is true. Anyone can grab, go to the, on the street, grab a few users, put them in front of a screen, ask them a few questions, and write a usability <coughs> test report. The point is that some of you are probably confusing it with this statement. Quality usability testing can be conducted by anyone. And of course, I agree, I disagree with that statement, because in the words of the famous software engineering guru, Gerald M. Weinberg, if you don't care about quality, everything else is trivial. In that case, you can write a, if there are no quality requirements to a usability test report or to the procedure you use for doing usability testing, then anything will do. <coughs> so I've done some studies for client. This is not a part of the CUE studies. So you need to take it with the, this information with a little bit of care. But I've done some studies for a client where I assessed usability tests done by other companies. This client was a very large European organization and they outsourced many of their usability tests. And so they were kind enough to ask me to do some quality checking of the results that they got in from their subcontractors. And I've taken the results here from 10 assessments and just one company passed with flying colors minor errors, but I actually learned from them. They did something so well that I said, gee, yeah, that's a way, very good way of doing things. Two professionals had deviations, but no critical deviations, from generally accepted good practice in usability testing. 
Five professionals had critical deviations. Two professional teams did so badly that I actually recommended to the client that they should not pay for the services. The usability tests were so badly done and so badly reported that they should not act on the usability test results. Can you give examples the client, of what they did? Yes, yes I can. A, uh, a major deviation would for instance be to have bad tasks that they used for the testing. Leading tasks, tasks with hidden clues, <coughs> testing, uh, um, testing issues that were um, peripheral to the website instead of focusing on the key tasks of the website. Uh, amongst the uh, <coughs> serious deviations were one that I called uh, measuring the babble ratio of the, uh, uh, of the uh, moderators. In other words, the, the moderators spent a lot of the precious time they had with the usability professional talking. For instance, demonstrating how to think aloud. Now, with the many hundreds of usability participants I've had over the years, it has never been necessary to demonstrate to people how to think aloud. Either they can do it by themselves, or they will do it after a little bit of prompting if it becomes necessary, or they just don't want to speak. And in that case, the usability testing method is so strong that you can get good results just by observing them anyway. My client decided to pay for it anyway, but they very nicely, very diplomatically, uh, are trying now to prevent future quality problems. They have developed and published usable guidelines for good usability testing, saying these are the typical problems, please avoid these in your testing. They ask all, their, all the agencies that they outsource usability testing to, to do a usability test while they are watching gives you a lot of feedback on whether the way they do usability testing is the same way that you do usability testing. And they of course make the assessments available to the teams and insist that they respond. And fortunately, I must report, most if not all usability professionals that I have met take pride in doing things right. It was just that they didn't know that what they were doing was no longer or had never been the best way of doing things. I'm actually working on this one because these guidelines to me are very important. So together with the German UPA, I'm working on professional certification schemes on several levels. The most important are the foundation level, which we call, do you speak usability? Do you master the basic terms of usability? And they turn out to be about 100 basic terms. We're not finished with this, so the list might, of course, change. We are also planning to certify usability engineers, usability testers, information architects, and information designers, or interaction designers, sorry. The basic idea is to have 40 multiple choice questions, and for the advanced levels, these two levels, the usability engineer and the usability tester level, also have a relevant deliverable. So, surprise, for a usability test, we would ask people to carry out a usability test and video record it and send it to someone or to a couple of people who are supposed to know about this kind of thing and ask them to judge, is this professional? Is this professional enough? measured by today's standards. The final one, which is not on your sheet, is your feedback to me. So, did this presentation change some of your views of usability testing? Wow. Thank you very much. Almost all green, two, two red ones and one yellow. Two yellow, three yellow. Thank you very much. And as I promised, I mean, I'm, I'm trying hard to do it right. Here's my final slide. Thank you very much.
much, Rolf. Um, does anybody have any questions for Rolf? Oh, here's my. Does anybody have any questions? Stop off. Uh, one of the reasons I disagree with the five people are enough, and I don't know if I'm right with this one. Wasn't the original statement that there should be five people per persona rather than five people? Is that what you view about? Ideally, yes. If you have a number of user groups that you target that are represented by personas, you would need at least one person per persona, and ideally, because a persona is a representative of a larger user group, you would ideally have more than one persona, say five, for each user group. The problem is that in the world where I live, the client, it takes a lot of time to even convince the client that they should run five usability tests. And, and then again, we come back to what I'm saying today, five usability tests, even if they're not perfect, are a lot better than doing nothing at all. And at the back, Hi, um, yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of a lot of these abilities are all in the lab now, and all of this is in the lab, or, you know, or the kind of outside of what's going to be in the lab, or Rob, can I just... The uh, question is yeah, whether yeah. What, what I think about usability testing in the lab and outside the lab. Uh, my basic point on that is to go back to my dogma number two. I've never seen a study that proved that a usability test in a lab was better than doing it out in the wild or just doing it in an office room or, or in a Starbucks cafe or wherever you might want to do it. Actually, to me, the important thing of the choice between to lab and not to lab is to make sure that the developers, the stakeholders, have a chance to observe the usability test. So I, almost all of my tests are run at the client's <coughs> location. And they usually don't have a lab. Some of them actually do. But most of them don't have a lab. And then I say, forget it. It's more important for me that stakeholders and developers can drop in during the test, stay for five minutes, and then hopefully after <coughs> these five minutes, they will say, I can't believe this, and I really don't have time, but I'll stay for another 15 minutes. And the lady at the back there, yeah? I'm all for it. The question was what I think of unmoderated and unobserved uh, usability testing. There are great organizations like usertesting.com that will actually allow you for a reasonable sum of money to have a to get by 20 minutes of a user's time and then get a video of what these users did. And I think it's great. And it's very interesting. These tests are unmoderated but they still produce very interesting results. So you might ask very nastily, what do we have moderators for? <laughs> Are moderators really needed? That hit me hard when I first uh, considered that because I make my living, moderate, part of my living, moderating usability tests. So does this mean that I'm not really necessary? Well, fortunately it does because the moderator does many other things. He or she assures the good quality of the test questions. And with unmoderated testing, I've found that the quality of the testing is much more important than in moderated tests. Because in, in a moderated test, you can repair minor faults in the tasks on the spot. You can't do that in an unmoderated test. If the participant does not understand or misinterprets your, your task question, then you're lost. So, with unmoderated testing, I strongly advocate that you run one or two pilot tests. Go back, revise the usability of the, of, the, of the test script you have, and then conduct the remaining three, four, five, six, seven, uh, nine, ten tests. Um, how do you deal with a widespread industry view, which is that usability testing is extremely complex and really expensive and doesn't fit within our budget? Oh. How do I deal with the, with, the, uh, with the viewpoint that usability testing is expensive? Well, it is expensive. Let's face it. It's not, it's not as cheap as it should be. We have not been able to reduce 
our prices and costs as much as we should have during the past few years. In Denmark, we have an interesting organization uh, that now, uh, they, they are a usability testing service. They provide participants 20 minutes of a Danish participant's time. But they also provide a usability test report. And they provide the whole thing for 1,000 pounds. That's pretty, uh, that's a lot cheaper than what I charge. Their secret is that they've managed to squeeze usability professionals down in price. So they pay the usability professional who analyzes the five videos about 300 pounds for the job. And I was surprised to see that if we get squeezed, if people like me get squeezed enough, we can still produce decent, not perfect, but decent quality at a reasonable time. But my answer to this question is also try to consider what you are doing as a usability professional. First of all, know and record how much time you spent on a usability test. And then consider very carefully for each of the activities you have during a usability test. Could that be optimized without sacrificing quality too much, of course? Is it really necessary to have both a moderator and an observer <laughs> during a usability test? I found that it is. Many of my colleagues disagree. And my view is it's very nice, especially from a social viewpoint, to have a colleague that does a usability test together with you. But is the additional cost really justified? <coughs> I don't think so. Results don't get twice as good. Did you have one, John? Yeah, you, um, you gave some interesting results there about how um, in your powers of tests, different teams manage different costs. Yes, yes. You then mentioned these horses for us and filtering issues. Yes. How much of that, how much of 